partly because you have some something that marks you out from the norm, like a tilt towards autism, because a lot of the people, it was just released with the Tavistock staff, you know, the Tavistock closed down in the UK. That was the big gender surgery performing institute in the UK. How, how was that closed, closed down? down? What happened? Government closed it down. So yeah, they got, because they knew that, they, they figured out in the UK that, wow, the rates of transgender transformation requests were skyrocketing. And even the people at the clinic knew that they were rushing people along the transformation pipeline way faster than they should have without proper clinical evaluation. What? There's a thousand lawsuits out against the Tavistock in the UK now. Wow. A thousand. Uh, yeah, out of, I think, 30,000 uh, transition processes. So what is the difference between the way the UK is processing this versus the way we are? Well, we're still where the UK was three or four years ago. We haven't woken up to the fact that, you know, all hell's going to break loose on this front with people like Chloe Cole, you know, launching, launching lawsuits. That's the only thing that's ever going to stop this. Lawsuits. Lawsuits, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Or jail sentences. So, like, it's absolutely appalling. This is part of the reason that I've also part of the reason that I felt like I've been at war for like six months. It's, it's like, so this crazy that too much. this what you're saying here, although it's backed by the literature, it's it's obvious you have an expertise in this area. That this is this is labeled as transphobic. Yeah, this is yeah. a transphobic. Well, it's conversation. even worse than that, you know, because the data, and this was known, let's say, ten years ago before this all became an issue. Ken Zucker in in Toronto, he was the world's leading authority on transgenderism. You know, he divided it into two parts. There's the autogynophilic types. Those are the guys who get sexual kicks from dressing up in women's clothing and then go dr do drag queen story hour. Say, well, we're just, you know, pristine and pure. It's like, no, you're not. You're getting a sexual kick from dressing up in women's clothing. And let's not bloody well forget it. And you can't even say that now, but every clinician worth his salt knew that for decades. And then there's another subpopulation. And those are usually gender non-conforming kids. And, you know, like a conservative skeptic might say there's no such thing. It's like, no, there, there is. So your typical gender non-conforming kid would be, this would be the perfect target for this, would be feminine boy or a masculine girl who's high in trade openness, so has kind of a mutable identity, who's also high in neuroticism. And there's lots of kids like that. And so they don't fit in that well with their peer group. You know, they're tomboy girls or feminine boys. And then if you track... A lot of them, some of them develop body dysmorphia. They're not very happy with themselves at puberty because they don't fit in. But Zucker showed very clearly, he ran the transgender treatment clinic at CAMH in Toronto for decades. And he was one of the world's leading authorities in terms of publication. I think he was the editor of the lead journal for years. They just took him out in Canada, fired him and disgraced him. And he battled on the lawsuit front for like 10 years and was eventually vindicated. But he didn't have a political bone in his body. He was a clinician through and through, you know. He wasn't playing political games, documenting autogynophilia. That was just clinical reality. Now it's, it's become verboten to even suggest such a thing. Oh, there's nothing sexual about this. It's like, yeah, right. You're dressing up in lingerie before your mirror at home, tucking your dick between your legs, imagining you have a vagina for sexual kick. Oh, there was nothing sexual about that. Yeah, right. Bloody absolute liars. Now, then you have the kids who don't fit in on the gender front. That's a different pathway. But with them, if you leave them alone, so do no harm, leave them alone. 90% of them accept their body, their sex, by age 18 or 19. And 80% of them are gay. So what that also means is, and the gay community is going to wake up to this sooner or later, is that <laughs> most of the kids being sterilized and mutilated are gay, 80% of them. So I don't see how the LGBT alliance is going to hold up under that sort of reality. So, yeah, that's for sure, man. What a crazy yeah, and here, situation. And here, let's add something equally ugly to it, since we haven't gone far enough yet. So here, we'll do a little bit of arithmetic. So a while back, Disney executive ma mentioned on video this is when florida went after disney it was all when this was happening she came out and said i think she was head of domestic programming for disney she said well i have two children five and seven one is trans and the other is pansexual and i just thought mathematically right away it's like the chance you have a trans kid is one in three thousand that's not a very high chance and let's say the chance that you have a pansexual kid is the same 
whatever pansexual means. I don't even know how to calculate those odds. But whatever that is, is rarer than trans because no one ever even heard about it until five years ago. So the joint probability that you have a trans kid and a pansexual kid is one in nine million. The odds that you're a pathological narcissist sacrificing your own children to the glorification of your compassion is 8,999,999 to 1. So like, do you have a trans kid and a pansexual kid? Or are you a devouring mother? Well, you can look at the odds and decide for yourself. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oof. No kidding. Look, man, Freud was no dummy when he pointed to the fact that the devouring mother was one of the major impediments to proper human development. He knew that, mm. looking deep into the darkest families and seeing this proclivity of the overprotective mother to destroy the developing integrity of the child, to keep the child infantile, to cling to that relationship instead of developing life for herself and letting the child go flourish. That's Hansel and Gretel, right? Mm. You're lost in the woods. Why? Well, your family's broken up you have an evil stepmother so now you're lost in the woods what's your abuse rate if you have a step parent 100 times normal so you're lost in the woods well what happens well you come across a gingerbread house well that's pretty damn convenient you need a house it's a little it's more than you could even hope for it's not just a house it's a house made out of candy well what's inside a house made out of candy a witch who wants to fatten you up and eat you and that's the devouring mother, you know, and that's an old fairy tale. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, and so, you know, we could, we could dwell on that for a minute too. One of the things we won't honestly discuss in our society, one of many, is the fundamental nature of female political psychopathology. You know, and there's male political psychopathology, obviously. That's what the feminists complain about all the time when they talk about the oppressive patriarchy, you know, toxic masculinity. There's no shortage of toxic masculinity. So is there any toxic femininity? Well, not if the feminine is just the, you know, oppressed virgin goddess whose nature, but how about we don't live in that fantasy world? And we know, yeah, there's female political pathology, the tendency to inf infantilize everyone, and the tendency to assume that everyone who doesn't go along with the infantilization is properly characterized as a predator. And so, you know, you wonder why are the universities turning into extended daycares? Well, a lot of the, a lot of the reason for that is that well, women who don't have anything better to do are turning the university students into the infants they never had.